Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Chief tried to pull rank and ended up damaging more stuff because he simply wouldn't listen to reason or the mechanics. The second story, Dispatch decides to send me on a job I won't be able to make it home from. The third story, Neighbor complained about me to the HOA, so I messed up her lawn and reported her. The first story is, the truck doesn't work, move it. Background, I was in the army at the time, serving as a mechanic in Fort Hood. This story isn't about me per se, but the leadership I worked with at the time. I pretty much witnessed the whole thing, and it's become one of my favorite memories while serving. Characters, Motor Sergeant, Sarge, Motor Chief, Chief, the Driver, and Ground Guide otherwise known as the poor mechanics. For clarification, Chief is in charge of everyone at the motor pool. Sarge is kinda like a second in command. Essentially, they both outrank all the mechanics in the motor pool. So, if either one of them say you need to do something, you do it. It's not worth fighting back sometimes. On to the story. So, this occurred around late fall a few years ago. Me and some of the other mechanics were finishing up trying to find a stopping point, so we could clean up and go home on time. Doesn't always happen, but hey, we try. Cue me going into our office to help sweep get everything organized and whatnot. When I overhear Sarge and Chief going at it, I didn't bother to remember the whole conversation, mainly because it was above my pay grade and was more worried about food. I didn't really think it would affect us. Oh boy, was I wrong. Later on, one of the poor mechanics told me that Chief was trying to get a Humvee, small truck, that was way overdue on a service and he was trying to figure out what vehicle we could get out of the base so we can bring the Humvee in. Unfortunately for him, almost every truck was on jack stands and had no tires on. Most vehicles were in for services, others had faults that were a priority, cracked windshields, oil leaks, etc. So he targeted the one truck that was an LMTV, a bigger truck, that wasn't in for a service and wasn't on jack stands. Apparently after a heated argument between Chief and Sarge over the fact that the LMTV was not safe to take out yet, Chief basically pulled rank and said no one would be going home until the LMTV was out of the bay and the Humvee was in the bay. Suffice to say Sarge was mad. All the mechanics were mad, but we really couldn't do anything to defy Chief. It's important to note that our motor pool, the bays in particular, rests on a small hill and the side of the hill that the LMTV was on goes down towards some grass, fenced with barbed wires, and some connexes also known as shipping containers, but we all just call them connexes because it's easier to say. So cue the malicious compliance. Sarge was ordered by Chief to get the LMTV out of the bay, so that's what he was going to do. He grabbed two poor mechanics, one is the driver and the other is the ground guide. While the ground guy was opening the bay door, the driver was trying to start the truck, only for it to start, then die a few seconds later. The LMTV wouldn't stay on for more than four to five seconds. The driver quickly informed the Sarge, who was watching the whole time. I know was all Sarge replied. Basically, he just told the poor mechanics to send it. So they did. The driver started the truck, and with the help of the ground guide began to drive forward, only for it to die yet again. The front half of the LMTV had barely made it out of the bay. At this point, the second problem had arisen. The brakes didn't work well, so instead of coming to a complete stop, the truck was very slowly going down the hill. The driver was trying to make a hard left, but couldn't go any further left and was slowly going towards the corner of the connex. Ground guide and driver again shouted that the truck wasn't working and now the brakes are having issues. Big Sarge said nothing and just watched. Then after what seemed like forever, the LMTV finally made contact with the connex, creating a small dent in the connex and a slightly bigger one on the LMTV. No one was hurt. After the collision, the driver tried to start the truck again, but now the truck wouldn't start at all. Furthermore, the path toward the bay had been almost completely blocked off, so no vehicles would be entering that way. Big Sarge simply did a small nod, told the poor mechanics to stand by, and went back inside. From what I heard later on, Chief was peeved. He tried to tear Sarge a new one for allowing this to happen, when Sarge reminded him that he had told Chief repeatedly that the LMTV was in there for those reasons, and that he had informed Chief multiple times that something like this was going to happen, or worse. He had also reminded him twice that the Humvee literally right across from the LMTV was on was on jacks, but service had not started, so they could have simply put the tires back on, drive it out, and bring in the Humvee that was overdue. But Chief was so determined to take the truck that wasn't on stands yet because it seemed easier. He then finished it with, I was just following your orders, Chief. 
Chief had to give in and ask Sarge that the Humvee that was across the LMTV in the bay be taken off Jax and taken out the bay so they can bring a wrecker, an even bigger truck, to try and bring in the now dented LMTV. Sarge kept the two poor mechanics, grabbed three more, and sent the rest of us home. I'm told they spent a good two to three hours to bring everything back to normal. Chief never harassed or pulled his rank on Motor Sergeant from that point on. The next story is, I said I didn't have time for that. So do you want to tell the boss that I'm stranded and on the clock, or can I? We will turn to one of the great banes of every trucker's existence, the Federal Hours of Service Regulations. The HOS rules are so Byzantine and impenetrable that they might as well have been crafted by Anthemius. A full explanation would need animated diagrams, and preferably narration by John McLeish. But the ELI-5 explanation is that all freight drivers have to keep track of four clocks. Drive clock, 11 hours, only counts down while behind the wheel. Resets after a 10 hour break. Duty clock, 14 hours, counts down when you first go on duty and doesn't stop or reset until you complete a 10 hour break. Break clock, eight hours, counts down when you first go on duty and doesn't stop or reset until you complete a half hour break. Weekly clock, 70 hours, a sum of all time driving or on duty for the past eight days or since your last 34 hour break. Can also be 60 hours slash seven days. If any of those clocks run out, you can no longer drive until you take the appropriate break. Of course, these are only rules until they aren't, and the regulations have more loopholes than Himeji Castle. For instance, I'm considered a short haul driver, which means that in exchange for a number of restrictions on how and where I drive, I don't have to keep my own time log or keep track of my drive clock, unless I work more than 12 hours, in which case I do. I'm still limited by the 14 hour duty clock, though once per week I can extend that to 16 hours. Still, company policy is not to load drivers after they hit 12 hours. It's safest that way. That brings us to Gary, my dispatcher. My old dispatcher Jack had been dumped on scheduling for playing games with how he dispatched drivers. Gary apparently never got that memo. I've met dispatchers who were former drivers. They tend to have a solid idea of the realities of driving. Gary was not one of those dispatchers. Gary saw the world through his tracking map, which didn't bother with inconsequential things, like traffic or elevations. Trucks were just little blips on his board, and he seemed to delight in moving those blips around. Gary thought of himself as a prankster and a wit. If he had known the word, he might have described himself as puckish. If his drivers had known the word, they would have thought it was one letter off. And that's how I ended up in Corona, California at 1 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. I call Gary and tell him that I'm at 11.5 hours, and I need to start heading back. Gary needs me to take another load. Their local plant is closed, and I'm the only driver available at a neighboring plant. I pull under, figuring that this is going to be somewhere in Riverside, maybe San Bernardino or Moreno Valley, somewhere vaguely in the direction I'm going, that will let me get my grumble on without actually delaying me too much. It's in Tustin. Tustin is not on my way home. It's the opposite direction, on the other side of a way station. And of course I'm at a plant with no scale, because trying to send loaded trucks through the Santa Ana Canyon is the kind of employee management you'd normally expect only in Dickens' most unhinged laudanum dreams. Still, Dispatch wants me to go. I call my manager Bob before I leave him to know what just happened and that someone is going to have to collect the truck and me after this job. I'm certainly not going to brave the scale goblins without being able to check my load, so it's time to partake in the time-honored trucker pastime of dodging the way station. I have to go 20 miles out of the route and drive through the Orange Crush, which is as much fun on a Friday afternoon as it sounds, to reach the job. For those who live in the area, it meant taking the 71 to the 60, then coming back down the 57. The job itself goes off without a hitch, but now it's after 3 p.m. I have half an hour before I can no longer legally drive, and I'm on the wrong side of the Santa Ana Canyon, which at this hour is moving at about the same speed as my aunt on her rascal. I call Gary to let him know that I won't be making back to my home plant, and he sounds a little cowed. It turns out Bob called the regional manager, and the regional manager called the operations manager. The operations manager called Gary. From what I gather, he called him many things. Gary asks, practically pleading, if I can make it back by 16 hours. I can't. Not through the traffic I'm facing, but that's a moot point. With malicious cheerfulness, I reminded him that I blew my 16-hour exception on Tuesday, when he decided to send me on a late afternoon run up to Joshua Tree. I've got just enough time to get my truck someplace safe and park it. When they figure out how to get me back, they'll find me at the crab cooker just off the 55 freeway in Tustin. There had been several night pours on the previous night. That was why it started at 1.30 a.m., as a result, they don't have anyone with the hours to make the round trip out to Tustin and back, not during rush hour. In the end, they find a rock hauler who had a tanker endorsement on his license. Mixers need a Class B license with tankers. Rock trucks need Class A with double triples. Coming on for night shift. 
Bob offers to drive him out and bring me back. By the time I clocked out, I'm over 18 hours for the day. Bob got overtime for the trip out and back, and he told me to just stay home Saturday. Last I heard, Gary had been moved from dispatch to IT. The last story is, neighbor complained to the HOA about my yard. So I have a Karen for a neighbor. She's a grumpy old C with a live-in son in his 40s and no other family or friends. And when I say she's a Karen, we're talking to the point that she came into my property to yell at our landscaper about a boulder he was installing on our property. Something about believing it would fall over onto more of our property. A few months after we moved in, we received a letter trying the HOA, saying they'd receive complaints and asking that we make sure we're mowing, watering, and maintaining. I chalked it up to moving into a nicer neighborhood and made an effort to mow twice a week instead of my normal once. Added a little time to the sprinklers and figured all was good. Apparently it was not all good, as we received another letter stating the complaints had continued and the HOA wanted to talk to us to see what the problem was. I should note we had just moved in not that long ago and hadn't landscaped the back yet, so we're letting our dogs pee on the front at night which led to the inevitable patches of bright green grass that grow stupid fast. Now I'll freely admit I don't keep my yard to the level of some of my neighbors, but it was in perfectly good shape outside some green spots in an otherwise average looking yard, and I do my best to keep things mowed and looking decent. Turns out Grumpy C had taken real offense to this and started complaining to the HOA. The hearing ended up bringing mostly incoherent rambling, but the bottom line was she didn't like how our lawn looked with the green spots. While the HOA agreed that this was not her business, and definitely not theirs, I decided she was right, and we should stop letting our dogs out in front to pee, as I also don't like the green spots. Now I put them on the leash and let them do their business in her yard. Read Tree Lawn, and I'm clearly not the only one, as her entire yard is now covered in pee spots and dead spots on her actual lawn, which my dogs don't step for on. I'm pretty sure she's complained about everyone with a dog, and now the entire neighborhood takes their dogs to her yard. The best part? She actually does an SH job taking care of her lawn. Weeds and crabgrass everywhere. She just waters it almost non-stop. So today I got to report her to the HOA for her yard looking like total SH. If it were any other house, there are much worse. I wouldn't care at all. But this lady wanted lawns without spots, so I'm just doing my part to enforce her rules. Edit. To everyone hating on HOAs, they're hit and miss for sure. But in this case, they didn't do anything but tell me to someone complained and then tell her I wasn't violating any rules, and they weren't going to be involved. Also, HOAs are often surprisingly easy to take over. You just have to skip the whining about how terrible they are and do the work instead. If the HOA is that bad, talk to some neighbors, tell them you're going to run for the board, and get them to vote for you. Then help others do the same, and remember what you hated about the previous board. Be forewarned, everyone finds a reason to complain. No one is willing to help out. Edit 2. For everyone about green grass from dog pee, urea equals ammonium equals nitrogen for plants. If you don't water it, it stays concentrated in one area, killing the grass. If you do water, or just spray the spot with a hose quickly, it's diluted and gives the grass a big boost of organic nitrogen fertilizer. Subscribe, hit the like button, and have a nice day.